Welcome listeners. You are listening to a podcast from the Free People's Movement, out of Sweden. Episode 14. Money Mechanics, the Foundation of Globalism. If you are listening to the audio-only version of this podcast, make sure you follow us on YouTube and Rumble, as this episode contains some supporting graphics. As we established in our previous episode with the help from the Lord of the Rings novels, our monetary system is a system of control. The rings within rings, within a ring. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. To help illustrate how this control over entire populations is expanded and maintained, we will in this episode go into more detail on how money is created. Money is created the moment a bank issues a loan. The loan consists of a principal amount, a term, and an interest rate. The principal amount is the same as the face value of a loan. A term is the amount of time it takes to eliminate the debt. The interest rate is the amount charged on top of the principal amount by a lender to a borrower. The bank records the loaned credit as a deposit in their balance sheet. At the same time, the same amount is posted to your account, that you can then spend. Now, the same amount of money as the principal amount has been created. The money needed to pay the interest, however, has not been created. This means that for every credit created, there is a deficit for the repayment of the loan. This means, that in order to pay the interest, more money needs to be created. Another indebtment has to be made, also with interest attached. And in order to pay the interest on that debt, more money needs to be created, also with attached interest. And so on, and so on. This means that the deficit in the economy is getting bigger and bigger, as it accumulates over time. This is called compounding interest. Due to this fact, more and more credits are constantly needed, to be able to support the cost for the compounding interest. What happens at a given point in time, is that the system becomes saturated with debt. This is called the debt saturation point. What does that mean then? Well, it means that for every newly created unit of money, more than half of the value of that money will be needed to support the cost of previously created money. The problem keeps getting kicked down the road, and is also made worse and worse. What then happens, is that the financial part of the economy, where trading in stocks, currencies and other debt-based financial instruments are conducted, needs such a large inflow of money, due to the ever-growing interest cost, that the money available in the real economy will decrease. The accumulated interest cost sucks the money out of the real economy and funnels it into the financial economy. This has to happen in order to continue supporting the interest cost for previously created money. This phenomenon is called real economy deflation. This means that the flow of money to a greater extent flows out of the real economy and into the financial economy. The direction of the flow of money is out of the real economy and into the financial economy. This causes a deflation of the real economy. This large inflow of money into the financial economy leads to a rise in financial asset prices. The price of shares and other financial assets then begin to rise at the same time as the real economy is shrinking. As the real economy shrinks, the public's ability to consume goods and services decreases, and this leads to the real economy stagnating. We then have a deflationary and stagnant real economy, at the same time as we have financial asset price inflation, in the financial economy. The collective term for this condition is called, stagflation. At this point, the only thing that can be done to delay a system collapse, is to expand the credit mass even more which means, creating even more interest-bearing credits, while dialing down the only parameters at their disposal. 1. The interest rate, the cost of money, must go towards zero. 2. Credit times, length of loans, must go towards infinity. 3. Credit worthiness, must go towards zero. More people need to borrow money. But this seems completely crazy, right? 
Why do we have an economic system that from the very beginning is doomed to crash? Well, it's because those who control the banks make money of the system. It's that simple. When a bank can create money out of nothing by putting people in debt to the bank and at the same time get paid for this magic trick, which is really no less than a pure fraud, these people who control the banking system will always try to perpetuate the illusion and protect the system. If the system fails, everyone will quickly realize that the value of the bank's fictitious digital confetti does not consist of anything at all, except the fact that everyone believed it had a value. It is said that the system is based on trust, and that is exactly what is meant. The second you understand how the system works, you realize that it can never work, and then the trust completely disappears. Those who control and profit from the economic system must therefore ensure that the public never understand the basic mechanics of how money is created. Since all money in our monetary system is based purely on debt, with an attached cost, called interest, the banks have done their best to make the system seem very complicated. No matter what they call different types of financial instruments, be it debentures, bonds, deposits, notes or commercial paper, its basis is still only debt, with a principal amount, a term and an interest rate. The term credit was first used in English in the 1520s. The term has traveled through different languages over the years, from Middle French credit, meaning belief or trust, from Italian credito, and from Latin creditum, meaning a loan, a thing entrusted to another, from the word credia, to trust, entrust, or believe. But the first creditors dates even further back in time. It actually dates all the way back to 3500 BC, in the Sumerian civilization. The Sumer was the first urban civilization, with about 89% of its population living in cities, where it is thought that consumer loans, used for agricultural purposes, were first used. Then in 1800 BC, in the Babylonian Empire, the Code of Hammurabi was written, formalizing the first known laws around credit. Hammurabi established the maximum interest rates that could be used legally, 33.3% per year on loans of grain, and 20% per year on loans of silver. Babylon was a historic example of debt slavery. One might wonder if we have learnt anything from history. Buying a house for example, with money borrowed from the bank, is called asset-based lending. Asset-based lending is any kind of lending secured by an asset. In this case, the house. The market value of the house reflects what is called the collateral value. This means, if the loan is not repaid, the house is taken by the bank. If the collateral value of the house doesn't cover the loan, you will still be in debt, even if the house is no longer yours. Since more and more money is constantly needed to cover the cost for the compounded interest, prices on assets, no matter what kind of asset, also have to keep rising. Like we've already said, since the system is always destined to crash, the collateral value of these assets will never be able to cover the debts. But why hasn't anyone said something? In fact, there are a lot of people who over the years have tried to point out this obvious problem. The explanation as to why people who criticize the system must always be discredited, or otherwise slandered, is because of what we said before, the system is based on trust. The system only works if we all believe in it. Why haven't economists and credit lawyers kicked and screamed in protest? Well, the answer to that question is probably a mixture between their own intellectual shortcomings and pure self-interest. Those who have understood the system have either kept their mouths shut and played along in the charade, or they have been silenced. Controlling money is the foundation of what we today call globalism, and is the most important tool of the deep state. Globalism is in fact, not that different from colonialism, as it is all about controlling the world's natural resources. There is today, little need for invading countries where they already control the economic system and the political agenda. If you want to be able to predict geopolitical and economic trends with any kind of accuracy, you must first accept a few harsh realities. 
First of all, the majority of cultural change and tax development within our system is a product of influencing public opinion through organized but competitive collectives. Secondly, you must understand that this collective polarization game is driven by the ideology of globalism, which is the pursuit of total centralization of economic and political control in the hands of a few individuals who consider themselves superior to all other people. Neutral is a term that demonstrates the relationship to a conflict between two parties, where the neutral is the third party who leads the conflict through the strategy of acting without being seen, avoiding paying the price of the created conflict. As the globalist insider, CFR member and mentor to Bill and Hillary Clinton, Carol Quigley openly admitted in his book, Tragedy and Hope. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching goal and purpose, namely nothing more than to create a world system of economic control in private hands that could dominate each country's political system and the world economy as a whole. Controlled in a seemingly openly feudalist way, the world's central banks acting in politically planned strategic consensus through secret agreements that have emerged at frequent private meetings and conferences. The pinnacle of the system was the creation of the Bank of International Settlement, BIS, in Basel, Switzerland. The BIS is a private bank, owned and controlled by the world central banks, which to one decisive extent was in turn controlled by private companies, politically independent. Every central bank tried to dominate its government, through its ability to control government debt. Also to manipulate foreign stock markets, to influence economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians, through subsequent economic rewards in business. In other words, to control the economy, and the politicians, which in turn controls the politics. All through confidence-building measures for the system, while in fact it was always the private banks themselves that controlled the amount of money circulating through their lending. The philosophical basis of globalist ideology is perhaps most clearly summed up in the principles of something called Fabian Socialism. A system founded in 1884 that promotes the subversive and deliberate manipulation of the general masses towards total centralization, psychosocial control, collectivist materialism and population control through eugenics. Globalists therefore prefer to implement their strategies for many decades, to transform a population slowly, rather than to try to force changes in a system immediately. Their symbol is a coat of arms showing a wolf in sheep's clothing, or in some cases a turtle, sometimes pictured with the phrase, when I strike, I strike hard. Another familiar phrase that speaks to their method is to act without being seen. Again, it is important to recognize that these people are not united by loyalty to any nation, culture, political party, traditional religion or ethnic background. In fact, they are happy to sacrifice any country or any of the above groups of people if it will bring them closer to their goal. Total Global Dominance They are not defenders of the free market that idiots on the far left tend to claim. In fact, they detest all business models that are not dominated by a self-controlled government and a bureaucracy that is designed to give them an unfair advantage, through legislation. Anyone who believes that free markets are the cause of our economic problems over the past decade, has lost perspective on the fact that the markets were never free, ever. Globalists are also not loyal to any particular theological tradition, at least not one that is clearly identified. Of course, many believe that they are organized around Judaism, or even have a kind of loyalty to Israel. This is the common argument, in what is now called, the, alternative right. Globalists don't care about Jewish people or Jewish beliefs, even though some of the globalists choose to call themselves Jews. Judaism is a geopolitical strategic tool for the globalists, and nothing else. The country called Israel was created as a geographical manifestation of this strategic geopolitical tool, it's that simple. Have you ever bothered to look at Israel's borders on a map, seen through the perspective of controlling the flow of natural resources, from Africa? So, while a minority of globalists are still associated with the political extremist faction called Zionism, the Zionists are just another exploitable group for the globalists. 
their larger goals have nothing at all to do with the glorification of religious romance and Israel. For example, they are perfectly happy to fund Islamic extremist groups, such as those with a desire and willingness to carry out the annihilation of Israel, or the murder of the Jewish people, if this would benefit their strategic goals. They are therefore also using elements of the Israeli government, in order to unleash chaos on the other side of the chessboard when needed. And things are indeed looking a bit dark, for the people of Israel. The American Jewish lobby is now more or less paralyzed, by this realization. There is no longer any possibility of the United States going to war for Israel, as the American people are tired of fighting other countries' wars. Those who argue that all our problems are constructed by the Jews or the Khazarian cabal is misinformed and has chosen an overly simplistic answer for a much more complicated enemy. They therefore usually cite evidence that is unconfirmed and poorly obtained. Some people are quick to believe that the Rothschilds are the basis of all globalism, when the Rothschilds today are a clearly subordinate element in a larger function of power through the global deep state. This is an enemy who has no loyalty to anything other than his own self-interests. Ask yourselves, which globalist institutions, within the deep state, are actually arguing for ultimate total Jewish or Zionist supremacy? There is no compelling evidence pointing in this direction, other than the obvious backdrop of a manufactured baby-eating Kazarian mafia, which is a myth perpetuated by the same globalist interest, that don't want you focused on what is really going on. All the globalist institutions in the deep state and their apologists actually openly argue for globalism, even at the expense of all Jewish people and Israel as a country. The deep state globalists have supported both fascism, communism and whatever other ism was needed at the time in order to further their agenda. The very foundation of the deep state's power lies in the creation of money and is maintained by the control of information. The deep state no longer have a total control of information, nor do they have control over the economic system. This economic system has in fact already collapsed, it's just not obvious to everyone yet. The deep state is being exposed for all to see. So, what comes next? Stay tuned, nothing can stop what is coming, is not just a catchphrase. Thank you for listening.